Well, welcome to our Monday Bible study. Uh, we are in Mark's Gospel as we continue to uncover the world of Jesus um, as we look at uh, the Gospel of Mark. Um, we ended uh, last week with uh, the scribes coming to Jesus after he has been casting out demons and essentially saying he's in league with Beelzebub, with Satan. And his family is at the door calling for him to come home. And um, the question becomes, as Jesus is doing all of what Jesus does, he's healing his miracles, and the evidence of God's kingdom is right before everybody. Why are those that are resisting it? And as we come to the middle of the first century and a little bit later, as Mark's gospel is being read and heard by its original audience, the question might be, why aren't other people like us accepting Jesus' resurrection, His teaching, and this new life and the new kingdom which He has pronounced? So we begin with chapter 4 with kind of that question already out within uh, our mindset because we've seen resistance from uh, the Herodians, the Pharisees, and the scribes, and even Jesus' family, just in the first three chapters of Mark. So the, the location of Jesus' parables, the beginning parable that he begins with, is of no coincidence because the rest of the gospel will see some of you know, what happens as Jesus goes about his ministry. So again, in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him, and he got into the boat on the sea and sat there. And while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he began to teach them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain." Other seed fell in good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. <coughs> and when he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom. For those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. That's a direct quote from Isaiah 6, and we'll come back to Isaiah 6 in a minute and ask the question, what does Jesus mean? And he said to them, do you not understand the parable? then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. So Jesus, in a rare uh, moment within the Gospels, Jesus unpacks his parable. Jesus doesn't do this. And in Mark's Gospel, the parables are not as many as you find in Luke or even Matthew. So, there's also a sense of mystery with Jesus' parables. And one of the things we know within Mark's gospel is Jesus is what? Keeping his identity a what? A secret. And part of that is only those that are looking, seeking. You know, Matthew uses the kind of the parable that Jesus gives of those that knock and those that seek are the ones that find. So are they looking for God's kingdom in the world? So Jesus says, unpacks this, he says, the sower sows the word. And in many ways, this is Jesus. He's sowing the word of God's kingdom. 
He's out there doing the active work. Later it will become that the apostles and the disciples will do the very same thing. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. So for some, that he throws the word is given, immediately when they get it, the opposition in the, in, in the world comes along and just takes it away from them. There's something that, that resists within them, whether it's their sin, whether it's the rejection, they choose something else. And immediately it just, it doesn't stick. And then Jesus says, and there are the ones on rocky ground, they hear the word and they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure only for a while then. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. So we can only imagine Jesus' early uh, disciples, but also the original audience of Mark knows people who have heard the word, accepted it, received it with joy, been a part of their community. But as soon as their family knocks on the door or somebody accuses them of not, you know, uh, following the gods or uh, being blasphemy of as Jesus is, is accused of in Judaism, immediately they say, and they leave. So there are some that don't accept it at all. There are some that accept it with joy, the kingdom of God. But once it becomes a little hard, either because of persecution or maybe um, trouble arises, they're out the door. And people, that first, that first audience of Mark knows these people because they've experienced it. We know people that get excited. Y'all have had people like that. And then you see them for a while and then they're gone. I think we've all experienced that. Not just in our families and church life. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. To live in the way of Jesus means to live counter to the way of the world. Where wealth and honor and privilege in Jesus' day were the things to be desired, Jesus says those are the things that aren't necessarily important in God's kingdom. And if those are the things that attract you, they'll come and essentially, he uses a, the image of a weed choking, but it kills it. And these are the ones who sow on good soil. They hear the word, they accept it, and bear fruit. Thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. That's a pretty good crop. That's a really good crop. And what Jesus is saying to those that hear it, yes, it appears at times like the word that's going out isn't really what? Producing much. But it takes time. And by the end of the first century, the church has spread, has grown across Judea, across Samaria, across the Decapolis and beyond into Asia Minor, into Macedonia, into Rome, even into places in the east like India. And by the second century, more. And the third century, more. So Jesus is saying that even though it looks like maybe not the best farming techniques. And one of the things I, I, I love about Jesus, Jesus tells his disciples to go out and, and sow the word as he is sowing the word, irregardless of who it might be going to and whether they accept it or don't. It'd be very easy just to go find the ones that would be easy, what? To sow the word to. But he goes to everybody. And it's up to the reception of those that, what? Are given the seed, whether they accept it or not. 
So we go back to Isaiah 6. If you've got your Bible, turn over to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 is a, a very famous uh, passage in Isaiah. Um, and for those that were in our uh, Wednesday night studies several a month or two ago, we talked about um, uh, how do we resist idol worship. And we used Isaiah 6 as a a way of thinking about um, throughout Isaiah there is this temptation for God's people to turn away from God and to worship something other than God. And Isaiah 6 is a vision of God on God's throne and a vision of the prophet being given the word to go and speak. And the awareness is even though he's given the word of God, how will those that worship things of wood and stone and gold and silver. So let's read it really quickly, and we'll talk about it just for a minute. Chapter 6 of Isaiah, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty. And the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voice of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people with unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of the people dull, and stop their ears, and shut their eyes, so they may not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and comprehend with their minds, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate, until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land, even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stumps remain standing when it is failed. The holy seed is its stump. So it's a curious passage. Isaiah, it's Isaiah's calling story, but it's also a calling story to be a prophet, to carry the word of God to the people. And as, you, as he is commissioned to go carry the word, it's also with an awareness, the more you what, tell, the less people will hear or see or understand. It's kind of a paradox, isn't it? And if you read Isaiah, especially 1st Isaiah, which is a, a good part of the, the first chapters, the pre-exilic period, Isaiah goes and the people, they don't respond. Very much like when Jeremiah goes. And one of the things we see within the Old Testament view of the prophet is the prophet goes out and carries God's words to the people. Now Mark doesn't do what John says, but John says that Jesus is the word. So instead of carrying the word, he becomes the embodiment, the incarnation of the word. And just as Jesus goes out, just like in Mark's parable here, some people receive it, but the majority what? At some point in their journey, they either stay with Jesus or leave. And the question becomes, if God's Word 
comes to God's people, why can't they hear it or see it or understand it? Isaiah, um, one, one way of looking at Isaiah is because in Isaiah's day, in the time of King Uzziah, after him and, and before and after, the people had been led away from the true worship of God by idols. And we talked about in that class, you become like what you worship. And if you worship things of wood and stone and metal, you become like them. You may have eyes, but like a graven image, you can't see. You may have ears like a graven image, but you can't hear. And you may have a heart, but like a graven image, it is what? Hard. Hardened heart. And here, Jesus is telling His disciples that He is publicly telling them these parables. But many will not be able to hear it or see it or understand it because there are other things in the way. And I think that's true today. You know, we talked, um, Dr. Moore talked yesterday, um, and he mentioned uh, the Matthew Commission at the end of Matthew. And he mentioned um, that as followers of Jesus, we are to go out and tell people about Jesus, point people to Jesus, and we are to make disciples and baptize them. And Jesus in Matthew says, and teach them everything I have commanded you. Well, you've got to read all of Matthew to go back, and that becomes the primer for Matthew's disciples. The Sermon on the Mount. The parables. These are the things that you, you, you are to teach them to live. This alternative way of living, the way, is the, what they called it in the first century, the way of Jesus. And the reality is, once you teach all of these things, people begin to say, okay, it's a little harder than I thought it was. Because I've got to turn the other cheek. I've got to forgive. I've got to show mercy as I've been shown mercy. And the early church is seeing people in, in Mark's, Mark's first audience. They, you know, this is written 30, 40 years after Jesus is resurrection and the early church has seen you know the the apostle paul is writing in romans his he still has hope for israel i mean there are many people that have seen and heard and still have not what responded and that becomes a question for us for us it's so easy to to follow jesus and we look at others and we say why haven't they and those first disciples were asking the same questions. <coughs> and we ask it too. But we also understand that even when it looks like Satan is, is taking away right out of the, the, the ground, the seed, whether it is the rocky ground, whether it is the, the weeds that come and choke it, and even with all of that, God takes what He has put out and makes something big out of it. From a mustard seed becomes what? A big bush. Jesus looks at them and He said to them, Is a lamp brought in and put under a bushel basket? Or under the bed? And not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone with ears hear to hear. Listen. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given. For to those who have, more will be given, and for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. He also said the kingdom of God is as someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and seed would sprout and grow 
and he does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is, is ripe, at once he goes in with this sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nest in its shade. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. So Jesus is teaching his disciples by using parables. Now, how many of us like parables? How many of us in Sunday school class just teach in parables? Not all the time. Parables are stories that often are allegorical or symbolic of a bigger reality, but oftentimes they have more than one meaning. You know, most of us, if we're honest, when we've read let's say in Luke's gospel, the parable of the younger son, the older brother, and the father, depending on what stage in life we are, it speaks to us differently. And that's for a reason. Parables have a life of themselves. And Jesus speaks in these parables, but in Mark's gospel, the parables are a little different than in Matthew and Luke because they are in some ways mysterious, because the kingdom of God cannot be what? Can't be quantified. It can't be hemmed in into a box. So Jesus has to use language that is beyond just definitive language. When Jesus teaches these parables, notice the language in Mark's gospel that he uses. He uses a water. What kind of illustrations is he using? Comparison. Comparison. But what are the what are the things that they see? Yeah. They're living in Galilee, which is the breadbasket of the area. Everybody in the area knows how to grow and how to harvest. He uses he's using imagery that they know and that they can understand and that they can see every day. And it, it, you, you would think as Jesus is telling this to people, every time they go out and do these activities, they think about them. You know, for us, what would be the illustration Jesus would speak to us about? You know, uh, if, if, if it was Ray, it would be something about, you know, fixing cars. You know, so Jesus uses language that is for them. You know, when Jesus calls his disciples, he says, I will make you fishers of men. Jesus is using parables for the people because they understand it. So we transition from the parables um, to a, a scene on the water. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. They woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? 
And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? If you remember when we were talking about um, fishing in the first century world, especially on the Sea of Galilee, uh, we watched the video of those fishermen. And they were talking about how you fished and they were talking about the landscape. And they talked about how suddenly a storm could come up. And most of us that um, can see Hogback Mountain, we can see usually the storm kind of getting pushed around it. But here, the, the water would cause the air pressure and it would come back and the winds would come up and a storm would come up quickly. So we can only imagine how often the disciples who were fishermen knew that this could happen. And one of the things we know about the Jewish people of Jesus' day, they did not like water. They might have been fishermen and they might have called the Sea of Galilee a sea, but it's a lake. It's not a real sea. Most of the stories of, of fearful things happen in water for them. Even their imagination of the greatest of creatures are the things in the water, the Leviathan. You know, the story of, of, of Jonah. Jonah's trying to get away from God and he gets on the water, which is a big deal, to go the other way. Where does he end up? He ends up in the belly of the fish and for three days under the water. For them, that's an image of death. So on the water, they're scared out of their wits. And Jesus is asleep. And Jesus wakes up, and peace be still, he rebukes the wind. Over the course of Mark's gospel, we've seen Jesus' authority over things. Over teaching, over the demonic, over sickness, over the Sabbath. And here we see Jesus having authority over creation itself. And we can only imagine how the disciples see this, and it fills them with awe and wonder and fear. Nobody else can tell the wind to stop. And notice that they go from one, they're on one side of the lake to the other side. I and mean, I don't have our map with us, but they're heading towards the other side of the region. Uh, and they came to the other side of the sea, chapter 5, verse 1, to the country of the Gerasenes. They're in Gentile territory, in the Decapolis. So notice within the gospel, Jesus is, the movement is always important for us to understand. Um, movement in any narrative is important, but movement, the physical location of Jesus, tells us something before we get there. Jesus isn't in Kansas anymore. Jesus is, is somewhere different. And the rules of that place are different than the rules of His place. Jesus is in Gentile territory. The question might be, how, why would Jesus go there? There's no reason for Jesus to go there. But He goes anyway. And he stepped off the boat, and immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Now so far, this is um, not uncommon. But notice the location of where he's at. He's in a graveyard. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. So this man, at some point, with this unclean spirit, the people, whether his family or the town itself, had tried to deal with it. At first they tried to restrain him, keep him as a part of what? Society. But eventually he got so out of control that they took him and essentially put him where dead people are. 
He lives among the dead. Not only does he live among the dead, he acts like a what? A wild animal. He howls. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed before him. Now notice, Jesus just told the parable about how the word gets spread, and a lot of times it what? Gets rejected. And a demon, possessed man, sees Jesus and understands immediately who Jesus is and what Jesus' mission is. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. This man has tormented, the demon has tormented this man, tormented the people, and now he's afraid, what? That he'll be tormented. For he said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. So this unclean spirit, when asked what his name is, name in, in, in Jewish tradition and in the ancient world, if you knew somebody's name, you had power over them. This is why Moses asked, Who is sending me? And, Je and, and, and God gives a very vague name, doesn't he? Tell them I am that I am sent you. God's name is mysterious and secret. Because God will not have any what? One person claiming authority over God. But here he says, my name is Legion. Legion, uh, in Jesus' day, the Romans, uh, legions were a group of soldiers. And a legion was a very large group of over a thousand men. Sometimes 5,000. It was a large division of the military unit of the Romans. And what did they do? They conquered. And Jesus is able to what? With his words, command a legion of opposition, of evil. Now there was on the hillside a great herd of swine who was feeding. And unclean spirits begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter to them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. Now for us, we know Jesus is in Gentile territory, and pigs were what? Unclean. So these unclean spirits enter these unclean animals, thinking that, okay, we'll be safe. And what does Jesus do? And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. Not only from a Jewish perspective did Jesus cleanse the man of the unclean spirit, he now cleansed the land of what? Unclean animals. Now I just want you to think about it. 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of pigs. <laughs> A lot of bacon, a lot of barbecue. <laughs> oh, you were thinking. Of that's that's eight thousand pig feet. I would say Jesus exterminated them. I, however, you want to say what that is, but they no longer have power and authority. The swine herders ran off and told it in the city and the country, and the people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demonic sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and the very man who had legion, and they were afraid. And those who had seen what had happened to the demonic and to the swine reported it, and they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. And as he was getting... Okay. Okay. We're in Gentile territory. Mm -hmm. 
and that was 2,000 people. Did they eat pigs? Ooh. The Gentiles? Yeah. 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 So that was a big part of their yeah. supply. Yeah. yeah. They're going to ask Jesus in just a second to, to get out of town. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you think about, I want us to, but let's think about the economics here. Martin doesn't get into economics as much as Luke does. Is one person worth those 2,000 pigs? That becomes part of the question. Also, the question is, when do you give up on somebody? These people have decided this man is as good as dead and we're going to put him in what? In the graveyard. He has been forgotten. He is begin, he, I mean, they've done everything they think they can do, and then they give up on him. You know, for us, we don't, we don't see demonic possession. I, when, I, when I hear of these kind of things, I think of people that have demons in their life, like alcoholism, drug addiction. And when we think about it, in our society, a lot of times we what? We put them... I mean, think about how many people you see that either have those kind of things, or PTSD, that are homeless. How many of us, in Inman it's not as prominent, but if you go to a city, you see these people, and eventually you stop seeing them. And usually they're regulated to underpasses, woods, shelters. These people, oftentimes you see them, and they're talking to themselves. They just got earbuds again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But the reality is, you know, if Jesus saw these people, how would, he, how would he respond? And to save these people, is it worth the economics of, of the loss? That becomes a question that some uh, text like this raises. <clears throat> Which is more valuable, the man's life? And that's hard because... The pigs were part of people's livelihood. You know, at what point is a, is, a, is a person's life worth it? When you stop giving up, it's hard. I mean, these are hard questions for us. We, we read the word demonic and we're like, okay, we know why they would send him out. But the demons that possess people today, you know, somebody that takes a first hit of a drug and within a year is totally dependent on it. That sounds like a demon to me. When they, when they take in something like that and it changes ex everything about them and they're willing to sacrifice everything for that thing. That sounds like a demon to me. As he was, uh, so they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. You know, when Jesus shows up, sometimes He disrupts things, doesn't He? Disrupts our lives. As He was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged Him that He might be with Him. He wants to follow Jesus. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home. Tell your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy He has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Jesus commissions a Gentile in the early part of Mark to go out and tell his story. That's the difference in the contrast of further back than uh, when he healed pieces, don't tell anyone. Yeah. Only thing yeah. is go show the priest or yeah. don't tell anyone else. Yeah. And that's because he's in his territory. But now he's outside of his territory in the Decapolis, and the word goes farther and farther away from Jesus, and Jesus is protected by that. Because the resistance for Jesus, as we'll see, isn't necessarily from the demonic, it's not necessarily from the Gentile. It's from his own people. And the question becomes, as God's people today, how, how sometimes do other people on the outside 
accept Jesus sometimes more earnestly and honestly than those on the inside. Also, Jesus, partly Jesus, I mean, this Gentile coming back probably would cause some problems. If you read the book of Acts, you see how that does happen. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. So what we have here is Mark will do, when, when Mark puts the stories together, a lot of times he'll do what we call a Mark and Sandwich. He'll start a story, he'll have something happen in the middle that breaks up the story, and then he has the conclusion of the story. So like two pieces of bread in the middle part. And here we have uh, really three stories if, that's not part of sandwich, but the, the Gerizim demonic is one. Jesus goes from one boundary to another, and where he has healed demonics, now he's healed Gentile. He's cleansed an area. He's gone back home, and the crowds gather around him by the sea. In verse 22, Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and said, When he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly. So like the Gerizim demonic, he, he comes to Jesus, and he, although he's not worshiping Jesus, he is pleading with Jesus. Come and heal my daughter. She's at the point of death. Now he's a leader of the synagogue. He's well respected in the community. He's someone of affluence. And we can only imagine to come to Jesus... For good or bad is a sign of desperation. Because the leaders of synagogues are in tight with the what? The scribes who are opposition to Jesus. So Jairus comes humbly, please and come. Now the crowds are, are following Jesus and a large crowd pressed in on him and there there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. This woman is bleeding. Twelve years of bleeding. In Jesus' day, if, if a woman was bleeding, she's unclean. And after her time, she would have to go and purify herself. Now, if you don't stop bleeding, you cannot what? Purify yourself. And guess what? If you're not clean, you can't be around what? Yeah. If you're observant, now this woman was desperate. She had endured much under many physicians and spent all that she had. So I want us to imagine this woman has an issue and she goes to people that say that they can what? Heal her. And what do they do? They don't heal her, but they do what? A take her money. We don't have that today, do we? <laughs> No, some things haven't changed. You know, and, and we can only imagine she starts out with the reputable people and eventually she's just like people that uh, are buying the elixir or the, the new pill that uh, the FDA hasn't approved or whatever else that they see on an infomercial. They're getting it. She's desperate. She's desperate. And desperate people are vulnerable people and they are what? Taken advantage of. So if she was married, she had no contact with her husband. Mm -mm. We don't know a whole lot about her. But she spent all that she had. So she spends all the money she has. She becomes essentially poor in the process. And she got no better, but instead she got what? Worse. She is a desperate woman. And she had heard about Jesus. And she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She knows she's not supposed to be in the crowd. And contact, even contact with clothing, was considered dirty. dirty. You, you become, that becomes unclean. You have to clean that too. You have to ritually purify everything. And came up behind him in the crowd to touch his cloak, for she said, if I touch but touch his clothes, I will be made well. 
Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Notice the woman doesn't ask Jesus. She has resigned in herself, probably deep down. If I ask, he'll say no. And this was her last chance. Her last, she's desperate. Yeah. It's not like whatever happens is going to happen. Yeah, and she's, and, and she's at a point, she doesn't have anything to offer him. She's going she's gonna, to she's gonna try to take whatever she can. I mean, that's how they're... She's, she's a starving person trying to get a loaf of bread. And she has nothing to lose. No, she's lost everything else. And Jesus feels the power taken out from him. He said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowds pressing on you. How can you say who touched me? Listen, everybody's around you. How are you going to pinpoint somebody that touched you? And he looked all around to see who had done it. And we can only imagine the woman standing there afraid. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell before him. Now a third person falls before Jesus and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. For the first time in a long time, she's been given good news. Want to know what the kingdom of God is like? This is what the kingdom of God is like. It's, it's about people that have been forgotten and lost, finding that there is new life. Whether they are a demonic possessed man in the tombs, or a woman who's been taken advantage of and cast out of society. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And we can only imagine Jairus getting frustrated as the, one, the crowd becomes an obstacle, but two, Jesus stopping and having a conversation with this woman. <laughs> Just being honest. Overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing. Loudly. It's an important person. And there are a lot of people that um, like to make a show. We've never seen that happen, do we? <laughs> and um, I'm sure it frustrated Jesus a little bit. Because they're what? They're taking advantage of a situation to be seen and known. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he was, there was commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he, saw, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Now the question becomes, we know what dead people look like, Jesus. She's not sleeping. How can you say she's sleeping? I'm always reminded of this passage at funerals. What looks like death to us is but sleep to Jesus. Is that the reason that we stay asleep in Jesus a long time? Maybe so. And they laughed in him. Then he put them all outside. We can just imagine Jesus getting frustrated. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. And took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went into the, where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talithith kum. So on occasion, Mark will include the Aramaic. This is Aramaic. 
And then he will tell us what it means. Now, Aramaic was the language that Jesus spoke. Jesus didn't speak Hebrew. Hebrew was the Hebrew that the Old Testament was written in that the scribes and the Pharisees, especially the scribes, would have read, would be like us reading Old English today. They spoke a language differently than, you know, so when they read it, they had to learn it. Uh, Hebrew today is not the same as the Hebrew of the Old Testament. That's why many Jewish boys and girls that go and learn Hebrew, even if they speak Hebrew, it's an old form of Hebrew. But they spoke Aramaic, which was similar but different. Uh, it, it was introduced and mixed in with culture after the Assyrians. Uh, so language changes over time. So Mark is writing in Greek, but he pauses and, and includes the Aramaic, and he says, it means little girl, get up. You know, a sleeping child is hard to what? Wake up sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> little girl, wake up. And immediately, the girl got up and began to walk. And notice, you see the quotations. I always like it because Mark is, we can tell that Mark is, is, is there's a scribe writing this and somebody's telling it. Because we hear, by the way, she was 12 years old. At this, they were overcome with amazement. Bruno, what does Jesus tell them? He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The reality is, Jesus tells people not to tell, and what do they do? They go tell. They go tell. We'll end uh, at the beginning of chapter 6. So notice within the, the Mark and Sandwich, Jairus begins, the one with the hemorrhage, end of Jairus' story. Notice that we have seen those that either are desperate, unclean, or those on the outside recognize who Jesus is. In chapter 6, verse 1, he left that place and came to his hometown. This is where people know Jesus the most. They watched him grow up. They babysat. They sat with him and his family in the synagogue. They worked alongside him. And his disciples followed him. So Jesus comes into town and he's got all of this group of people following him. I mean, you think about, you know, if we had somebody in our community that we knew and grew up with and they became famous and they bring an entourage back with them. You know, I can only imagine like Elvis's family. Like, you know, Elvis always had an entourage. And what would it be like to see him come home and you got all those people with him? Who does he think he is? He not know where he came from. Yeah. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard were astounded. Now they knew Jesus, but something about what he's doing now just astounds. Is, and they said, what is this? Where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that had been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Josie, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? Jesus comes back home and appears to be completely different. Something is different about him. And guess what? People don't like that, do they? Jesus is in a small town with small town folk. And Jesus shows up and he has got a crowd of people and he's speaking with power and authority and stories are circulating about him. And guess what? They're not really liking it. And they took offense at him. You can only imagine Jesus walking down Main Street and everybody just kind of snubs him. 
These are the people that knew Jesus the best. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown and among their own kin and their own house. And he could not do no deed of power there except he laid hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. For the first time in the gospel, we have essentially a non-miracle story. And the reality is, Jesus goes back to his hometown, and the people look at him, and they what? They find offense in him. And the early disciples of Jesus, that early church, when people follow Jesus and they go back home to their homes and their hometown, guess what? People are finding offense at them. And for the first time, we can look at Jesus and say, Jesus experiences some of the very same things we experience as followers of Jesus. When our lives change because of Jesus, there are some people that what? They don't like it. They don't believe it. They don't believe it. You know, we know people that are not the same people anymore. And it's hard to what? It's hard to accept them. But for these people, it would be like for us, you know, it's hard for us to imagine this, but, you know, what would it be like to have been either a Gentile or a Jew and decide that you're going to step out from your tradition, your family, and live in a completely new way and worship in a very different way? You know, I've known family members who maybe their son or their daughter decided to join a different religion. And guess what? They found a fence at them. Yeah. And for us, it's hard for us to understand because we, most of us grew up in Christian homes. We've been to church. We don't understand what it would be like to give up everything. And then as we are living out the life we feel God called us to do for the people that know us best to, to take offense at us. This is what is happening not only to Jesus, but those first century followers of Jesus. And for them to hear the story of Jesus experiencing what they experience, it's got to be comforting. If it happened to Jesus, how could we expect it not to happen to us? Let's close today. If you will continue reading chapter 6, we will uh, do that. You'll hear uh, John the Baptist. Uh, you'll hear about Herod. Um, and, and we'll talk more about some of the, the things there. Um, we'll also encounter the feeding story, the first feeding story that we will find in Mark's Gospel. Um, and we'll also see in chapter 7, Jesus again meeting someone from the outside. And a challenge comes to Jesus that I think is very challenging for us today. But let's close in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day. And God, we thank you for the word that you give us. Lord, sometimes we wonder how others cannot accept what we know to be true. But it doesn't mean we stop telling. Help us, like Jesus in the parable, continue to sow seed and recognize it's not up to us to make it grow. It's a part of your Spirit's work. Lord, help us to see those that are in our community, our families, who are desperate for Jesus. Let us go to uncomfortable places. Let us look towards those that have been taken advantage of. Let us not be discouraged when we, as we grow in Christ, find others who take offense at it. Help us, Lord, to continue to connect to you, to one another, and to grow in our faith. God, we pray all of this in Christ, our Lord's name, Jesus. Amen.